I have the privilege of introducing uh, Mr. David Pert. He's actually on our advisory board, so uh, he's kind of, uh, he's, he's really uh, in, involved with you guys. You don't know it, he's behind the scenes. He's helping you guys out. He's giving us advice. Uh, he's, he's giving us, you know, things to look for in the, in the, the business. And he's really been a big cheerleader uh, to our program for the last, almost the last two years. I know uh, last, last year he was with Com Week, and the year before that he was just, hey, what can I do? What can I do? So David volunteered uh, to come in and speak again this year. Last year we got him on, and he reached out to us, I want to speak at Com Week. So we really love uh, people that are involved and really the professionals out there. And David doesn't have to do this, guys. I mean, he, he could have sent one of his anchors, one of his reporters, or one of his editors uh, out to do this, but he really wants to connect with the students and talk with you guys and just be that voice in the vehicle. So, David, I'll let you talk about what you do. I know David is the general manager over at AT&T Sports, but I'll, I'll let you talk about your day-to-day -day operations and all that. But, David, we're super proud that you get here. We're going to hand it over to you. Arthur, thank you. I'm uh, honored, uh, truly uh, feel fortunate to be able to participate today. So thank you for the invitation. What I'd like to do is uh, share some slides with everyone and we can uh, take a look at some of this information here. And um, I will be happy to answer some questions when we get to the tail end of, uh, of these slides. Uh, can you see the slide that I have on the screen? Uh, yes, sir, we can. Right, outstanding. So um, for me, whenever I'm in a, in a setting like this, I, I'm always asking myself the question, who is this guy uh, and why is he talking to me? And so I thought I'd give you a little bit of background, a little bit of my background, and uh, then we can tailor this specifically to um, what you all were studying and, and I think what your aspirations are. So I've been in sports and media for over 35 years. I started uh, working in sports related fields, sports media, uh, when I was a sophomore in college, uh, so about your age. And um, I can vividly, although it's a long time ago, several decades ago, I can vividly remember sitting in presentations like this, trying to figure out how do I get from where I am to where I want to go. Uh, and so hopefully some of the things that we talk about here uh, will uh, uh, provide you some insight. Uh, I have worked for teams in all four of the professional leagues in North America, NHL, Major League Baseball, the NFL, NBA. Um, and uh, you can see some of those teams represented along the bottom of that slide. I have been responsible for literally every aspect of business operations for the teams that I've worked for. So everything from revenue generation, media relations, PR, reputation management, marketing, uh, venue management, uh, any aspect of sports. Uh, and then on the media side, I am currently the general manager of AT&T Sportsnet here in Houston. Um, we cover the Astros and the Rockets primarily. We have a number of other properties on our network as well. And so from our perspective, my background in sports has given me, I think, a unique perspective related to covering the teams that are on our network. And we can talk about that a little bit. Uh, I have been a part of four organizations that have won championships in their league, four Stanley Cup championship teams. I feel fortunate to have been a part of that. What I say to folks on the sports side of things and also been fortunate to work with the Astros here in this marketplace as their broadcast partner, I truly believe that championship teams have to be championship caliber on and off the field to be successful. And, uh, and I take a great deal of pride of the contributions that I've made associated with the teams that have won championships. I also have a great deal of respect for the Astros and Rockets organizations because for those teams to be championship calibers, a championship caliber, those individuals have to be uh, uh, 
performing at, a, at an elite level as well off the field. And then fun fact, um, over my career, almost four decades working in sports and media, I have worked nearly 2,500 sports, sporting events uh, over that period of time, whether it's with a team uh, or as a broadcast partner. Um, I, uh, if you put it in context and think about the number of events that you'd have to attend uh, over the course of a year, uh, over 35 years, it's a, it's a lot of nights out and it's, uh, and it's a lot of long days. Uh, but I feel fortunate to have been a part of organizations and businesses that have been associated with uh, all of those events. And I like to describe whether it would be working for a sports team, working for a media outlet, working in entertainment. Um, I heard somebody once uh, say to me, you mean you get to do fill in the blank? You mean you get to go to all of the baseball games? You mean you get to go to? And that really struck a chord with me. I think those individuals that choose sports, media, entertainment for their careers, uh, it is a get to job, not a got to job, right? And if your mindset is that I get to do this as opposed to I got to do this, um, I think it makes for a much more thrilling, engaging, rewarding professional career. Um, we use this next slide here. Uh, to talk about the power of sports, really when we're talking to advertisers about why they should advertise with our network. I use similar slides when I work for the team and talking to folks about the power of working, uh, be partnering with, being involved with, or coming to work with a professional sports franchise. Um, the power of sports is really represented in these two photographs. This photograph, um, I can't imagine anybody donning an AT&T logo or painting themselves with a, um, an AT&T blue uh, uh, face or wearing um, an astronaut's outfit uh, to go into a, an AT&T retail store. But, but when you're working in sports media or you're working for a professional team, the power of those organizations and the connection with those brands is really what makes it special and unique and unlike uh, any other profession, right? Even working in traditional media, uh, as much affinity as you want to try to create and develop for a local news product or a local television station, a local radio station even, it's really difficult to be able to harness the kind of embedded engagement that professional sports teams have, the communal component associated with the fans of a local sports team is undeniable, it's lifelong, it's individuals getting the logos tattooed on their body to give you some perspective of how powerful that, that draw is. We use that as a way of not only attracting viewers, but driving our business and helping to support the overall financial aspect of running a regional sports network. So uh, to give you just a little bit of perspective related to uh, the regional sports network business, uh, put it into perspective, there are three primary groups in North America that have regional sports networks, oftentimes referred to as RSNs. RSNs, Bally is, uh, is the largest of the group. NBC Sports has a sports network group as well, and then AT&T Sportsnet. That's the group that I work for. We have four regions. The regions include Pittsburgh, Southwest here in Houston, Rocky Mountain, which is in Denver, and our Northwest region, which is in Seattle. There are also, um, there are also independent 
RSNs, independent RSNs like the Yes Network, that's the Yankees Network, Marquee, that's Chicago Cubs, Altitude, that's also in Denver, but they carry the Nuggets um, in that market. Nesson is in New England, and Spectrum Sportsnet is on the West Coast in LA. So those are the regional sports network independents to give you a visual perspective of RSNs. What you see here is a representation of all of the teams that are broadcast on RSNs. There are a lot of them. Uh, predominantly, the keystone property in each one of the regions would be the Major League Baseball team. And then you would oftentimes complement that with one of your winter sports, either basketball or hockey, depending on your marketplace. And again, you will see here in just a minute in our region, our two primary properties are the Rockets and the Astros. Uh, that gives us 12 month a year programming. Right now, this week, we start to head into an overlap period where we'll have both teams on the network at the same time. Um, but for the most part, it's either one or the other of those teams that will, um, that will be on the network. Here's another way of quantifying um, regional sports network, the, the game coverage. There are almost 2000 basketball games a little over 4,000 Major League Baseball games and about 1,600, 1,700 NHL games that will be broadcast in the various RSNs all across the United States. That's a lot of games, uh, as you can see. In our region, in our region, let me change this slide. Um, I'll go back to, uh, uh, AT&T Sportsnet. So we're a part of AT. We were a part of AT&T Corporation. Um, AT&T just recently spun us to Warner Media, which is Turner Sports, CNN, um, TBS, Warner Brothers Studios. We are currently a part of Warner Media. Uh, the next quarter, in quarter two, we will actually be a part of Warner Media's merger with. Discovery Incorporated. Discovery is the Food Network, Magnolia Network. Uh, a bunch of content creators are a part of that Discovery Network. It will become, the merged company will become Warner Brothers Discovery, and our RSN will move into that group going forward. So our region, the RSN here in this region, uh, we televise Astros and Rockets. We'll do approximately 250 live events a year on our network. We broadcast to five states, Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and the eastern portion of New Mexico. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we have four uh, total regions. There are three other regions outside of ours. And... Um, will reach somewhere in the neighborhood of 4 million subscribers in our territory specifically. The way that our RSN is programmed for the Astros, Astros broadcasts go to the entire territory. Because there are other NBA uh, teams in our market, you can see the donut hole for uh, San Antonio Spurs, for the Dallas Mavericks, Oklahoma City Thunder, um, the Memphis Grizzlies, and Louis, uh, the, uh, the Pelicans, New Orleans, Pel New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, those marketplaces, the Rockets are blacked out. And so we broadcast only to the red portion of our territory for the Rockets games. The way that... Uh, uh, viewers, fans of our team watch the, um, the games on the RSN. Uh, there's a, three different uh, opportunities. If you subscribe to a linear 
paid television service, uh, those are listed on the left, like DirecTV, UVerse, Xfinity. Those uh, linear, more traditional platforms are the um, are the primary main of main vehicle of distribution. Uh, OTT, which stands for uh, over the top, those are virtual distribution platforms. Those platforms are uh, DirecTV Stream, Fubo Television. Uh, we are also available on those platforms. And in addition to that, our games are streamed on a mobile app that we manage and operate. If you're an authenticated subscriber of those other paid TV services, you can watch on your app. So take it to uh, take it to the library and watch while you're studying. You can uh, take it for your walk. You can uh, take it and watch it just about anywhere uh, on that app, provided you are a subscriber of one of those paid services. On our network, um, we have three tiers of properties. So the top tier, Astros and Rockets, that makes up the vast majority of our programming, uh, our live content on the network. We produce all of those broadcasts in-house. We also have um, what we refer to as tier two properties. Those are uh, game broadcast, including PSU, on our network, the Dynamo, the Sabercats, those properties, a third party produces those games, and we distribute them on our network. And then the bottom tier is other programming uh, that may have relevance um, to some extent. So we have college football and basketball from Mountain West and the Big Sky. Again, those are produced by a third party. They are less relevant to our market, to our region, uh, but they serve as live programming uh, so that whenever we have um, holes in our schedule, we can fill those with sports programming uh, on the network. So um, programming for Rockets and Astros. We're in the Midst of our rocket season, we'll do about 82 rockets broadcasts, live broadcasts on the network. Um, we will do the game. We do pre-game, post-game for every one of those uh, live game broadcasts. We also produce magazine shows, and we have rights to the first round of the NBA playoffs. On the Astros side of things, we'll do somewhere in the neighborhood of 155 live game broadcasts. We're getting ready to do our first spring training broadcast this week. We also do pre and post game shows. We do magazine shows, our base is loaded. And so that's the makeup of the vast majority of our programming that you will see on AT&T Sportsnet. To give you some perspective from a viewer perspective uh, of the, uh, the appeal of our programming, so for a live game uh, day for the coverage, our pregame show, about 25, uh, approximately 25,000 folks will tune in for our pregame show. Anywhere between 25 and 40,000 individuals will tune in for a pregame show. From a game perspective, we'll have anywhere between 100,000 to 125,000 individuals will tune in for an Astros game. And then for the post game show, about half of that audience will stick around and watch some portion of the post game show. So you can see that sort of that, uh, that arc that takes place uh, every day that we have live game coverage on our network. That same arc is very similar to what we see on the rocket side as well. Uh, but we're truly the definition of destination programming, right? Folks come to our network to see those games. Some will arrive a little bit earlier, some will stay a little bit later, but the vast majority of folks are coming to watch the live game coverage that we produce. To give you an example of our Rockets coverage, um, this is similar to what we do for, uh, for the Astros, but I thought I'd give you a little bit of perspective of 
sort of the makeup and the mix of the various types of programming that we do. We produce a weekly 30 minute magazine show for both teams. For the Rockets, it's called Rockets All Access. We do a, uh, every week we'll do an extended pre pregame show. It's called the tip off show. It's a lead in uh, a little bit more in depth. It's live, but we add that on uh, once a week uh, for the Rockets coverage. Then for every game, every Rockets game, we do a 30 minute live pregame show from our studio or from the venue from Toyota Center game coverage. Uh, and then the post game show. And again, if it's a home game, we'll broadcast from Toyota Center. If it's a road game, we broadcast the pre and the post game show from our studio, which is right downtown. If you know where the um, House of Blues is located, our studio is just right across, just adjacent to where the House of Blues is located uh, in downtown Houston. So in terms of uh, the staff that, uh, that operate our network, um, so this will give you sort of at a high level the various disciplines associated with running a regional sports network, uh, ad sales and traffic. Uh, those are the folks that sell the commercials and, uh, and make sure that they run properly. Uh, production, I'll break down the production group in just a minute, but uh, we have a, 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 a full-time staff of production specialists that work with us. Programming, those are the folks that do the schedule make sure that we have the appropriate time and background shows and all the other programming on the network so that we're 24-7. Uh, affiliate relations, those are the individuals that go out and identify the distributors or the affiliates that we work with. Make sure that folks like DirecTV and Fubo uh, have access to our programming and are airing the programming properly. And then marketing, those are the individuals obviously that promote and market the games on our network, promote and market the network as well. Those are the different disciplines uh, for our full-time staff. From a production standpoint, there's really three buckets of individuals that we work with. From production standpoint, we have a full-time staff between 12 and 15 in each one of our, uh, in each one of our regions. Uh, those are the individuals that do the pre- the post and the game broadcast. Um, they're the folks that do the magazine shows. We have engineers, we have operations folks, camera operators, editors, um, other technicians, uh, graphic uh, uh, operators that will work as a part of our full-time staff. And then we have content uh, uh, producers. And those individuals are the ones that will uh, come up with the ideas related to the shows and the programming that we are doing. Uh, they're the ones that are really overseeing each one of those individual shows and um, are the creative content cr uh, 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 individuals that are, uh, that are helping us make sure that they're telling the story related to how the team is doing, the players that are excelling, um, they're the ones that get fans more interested and uh, more engaged with the broadcasts that we have. Then we have a pool of freelance staff. Those are the individuals that are at the venue that are producing the live game broadcasts. They include a producer and director. They're the ones that sit in the production truck on site and they are the individuals also that include the camera operators and, um, and the other technicians that get the game on the air. And um, we have a staff of freelancers for every game we produce, any, anywhere between 20 to 30 individuals that would work on a freelance basis. And then we also have independent contractors and those are individuals like the broadcasters, right? The play-by-play -play announcer, the analyst, the folks that are uh, at the desk and, and uh, broadcasting the pre and post game show. They're the announcers that you see on TV, our reporters. Those folks are generally uh, independent contractors and, uh, and they work only on game night 
um, and, uh, and, and, and take on those roles associated with the broadcast that we are doing. So um, the RSN business is in the process of evolving pretty significantly, pretty dramatically. There's really three different ways to produce a live sporting event. And as a consumer, if you're watching sports on TV, uh, one of these three models is most likely being deployed to get that event on television. You probably can't tell the difference from where you're sitting and watching that game, but I'll try to give you a little bit of insight. In the middle of this slide, BAU, business as usual, um, those are dual and standalone broadcast. That's the way that games have been produced uh, really uh, since their inception almost uh, for television. And that is where we have a production truck. Um, the, um, uh, both the home and away uh, broadcast outlet would have a production truck at the venue. We had a, we'd have a full complement of freelancers for both of those productions. And uh, we would do those productions separate and independent of each other. One is for the home market, one is for the road market. Um, during the pandemic, uh, we were um, forced to do what is commonly referred to as a world or global feed. And basically what happens, that's the top line in this graphic, this slide, um, what we are doing is the home uh, broadcast outlet only is producing all the video visual aspects of that production. And then the announcers are sitting in their studio in their home marketplace, and they are broadcasting the game from a remote location. And so all through the pandemic, and for the first half of this past NBA season, we deployed a global feed model where the production was taking place, for example, in Los Angeles, all the video, all of that being done in Los Angeles, our announcers, our graphics operators, all of those folks were here in Houston. They were broadcasting the game from Houston. To give you another example, you may not be aware of this, but a good bit of this past Winter Olympics broadcast was done uh, remotely and done in that global feed. And so um, in Beijing, the uh, video and the camera operators and the production operation staff was located there. Many times the broadcasters were located in a studio in Connecticut, and they were broadcasting those events from that studio uh, remotely. And so we are now moving into the bottom level, which is cloud control. And the cloud control is, um, is sort of a hybrid of all of these. So cloud control, the video content, will come back to our studio here in Houston for a road broadcast. We will do all of the integration. Uh, we have individual feeds from all the cameras in that road location. We do all of that integration here in Houston. Although the, the announcers will then travel to those road markets and they will call the games on site. Um, so they're the only folks that travel. Everybody else is back here. We do all the technical integration of those productions back in our marketplace here. And eventually all broadcasts uh, for all sporting events will be done in this cloud control now that we have the technology and the ability to do uh, production like that. It's taken us a while to get there. Um, all of our Astros games will, will be done in this model. Back to games uh, starting this week for the Astros spring broadcast will be done as a cloud control uh, production uh, and then going forward all other uh, productions. So that's a little bit of uh, background related to the, um, the way we produce the broadcast. Um, I'll share with you a slide that we use with our broadcast announcers 
when we talk about sort of the, the vision that we have for a broadcast, this is applicable for both uh, our Rockets broadcast as well as the uh, Astros broadcast. And we really tell our announcers we're looking for three things. We want them to be storytellers. Uh, we want them to not just tell us uh, what we're seeing, like play by play. We want the why and we want the how things are happening. We want them to rely on their experience, right? And be able to uh, sort of convey their understanding of why and how to our viewers. And then the final point is we want them to be engaging. So from our perspective, we want them to be engaging with each other. We want them to be engaging with our, uh, our viewers. Um, and so the way we do that is we have social media components integrated into our broadcast. We encourage our talent to be very active on social media. So you will see them even during the broadcast engaging about the game on social media. So that engagement draws people in. It makes a connection with the folks that are broadcasting the games. We see that as a really, really important part of the, uh, of the overall broadcast presentation that we have. So I know I flew through a bunch of information there. Uh, does anyone have any questions related to the, uh, the slides or the information that I shared? I'm sorry, David. Say again, David. Any questions? Does anybody have any questions about that information? Any questions, guys, about the information in, in this classroom? Anyone online, any questions? Uh, this is, uh, I have a question. I was just going to ask, okay. like, what got him into like the world of sports in general? Like, what got uh, I have a student that asked basically, what got you in the world of uh, what you do in sports, specifically sports? Well, I, I, uh, I say oftentimes I was in the wrong place at the right time. I went to school for journalism. I, uh, I had aspired uh, while in college to be um, a, a broadcast journalist. And uh, when I came to the realization that it required that I uh, be able to write and spell correctly, uh, I figured out that I might want to try something a little bit differently. And so just by happenstance, I started as an intern at a radio station in Pittsburgh that carried uh, the hockey team there. And, um, and I uh, worked in production, I worked in traffic, I worked in sales. And about the time that I was working in sales, that hockey team was one of the first in sports that took their rights in house. So as opposed to the radio station owning all of the radio rights, and the local TV station owning all the television rights. Um, they took their rights in house, first team in professional sports to do that. And so I joined the team at a time when sports was turning more into a business. It was less exclusively about just team operations, but into sports marketing and sports promotion and, and, um, and, and selling the property. Um, and so I've been in sports or sports related sports media ever since, literally. Um, I came to the RSN side because when I was in Pittsburgh, um, I was working for the Pittsburgh Penguins at the time. And uh, I really wanted to get back to Houston. This regional sports network was being acquired by uh, DirecTV and AT&T. Uh, they were our broadcast partners in Pittsburgh, and, uh, and I convinced them that I would be uh, an ideal candidate to come back to Houston and run the, run the property, run the RSN. I knew the, I knew the team side of the business uh, really well. I knew the principals that managed the teams uh, for the Rockets and the Astros. Uh, so from that perspective, I was able to convince them that 
uh, I would be a, a good candidate to take over the RSN. This complete departure from, from anything that I had ever done, I had negotiated broadcast deals and had managed the broadcast relationship for teams on the team side, but I had never been on a regional sports network side of things. So I've sort of had to um, sort of reverse engineer what I already knew. I had to sort of learn a lot of the television side of our business. Um, I had to sort of embrace uh, knowing what I don't know. Um, and, you know, I think that's one of the lessons that I encourage everybody in this group to, to keep in mind is that, you know, over the course of your career, um, you may start in one place and end up someplace else. Uh, I'm a huge proponent, a huge proponent of looking for ways to find uh, scale, scalable, transferable skills so that, you know, the basic fundamental things that I learned in running and operating on the team side apply to running and operating at RSN. Um, I know uh, I can sort of anticipate my team partner's needs and when they ask for something, uh, having done that and been on that side, I have a sense of the importance of some of those elements. Um, so I know uh, a little bit about where they're coming from and uh, have the perspective of professionals that have done the TV side for, uh, for an extended period of time. So I also have the ability to, um, to be mindful of, of that as well. Um, so from that perspective, uh, I am not a huge sports fan. Uh, I think a lot of people find that hard to believe. Um, I have worked uh, some 2,500 sporting events in my career. I don't know that I've ever attended a sporting event where I didn't work or um, wasn't associated with one of the organizations that I worked for. Uh, so that's not my, not my primary interest. And for me, I, I, you know, it's what I do. Uh, it's not necessarily exclusively who I am. I think that's actually a benefit. Um, if I were a sports fan, I think you're a lot more emotional about the ups and downs associated with, um, with a team's performance. And uh, I'm thinking more about the, the business and the professional side of covering the teams that we cover. Um, so uh, from my perspective, that's, that's a part of it. Um, I put one more slide up on the screen. Nobody asked me this, but um, you know what I what I would suggest is if you're looking for um, if you're looking for my uh, advice on how to get started in a career in sports, media, or entertainment, I consider those all to be highly competitive industries. I would I would give you a couple of points of advice. The first is to create as big a target as you can. I think a lot of times folks, uh, when you're first starting out, have a single job and a single location uh, singularly in mind. And what I tell folks is broaden your perspective and your definition of, of the job you want. Look for jobs that are similar to what you ultimately want to do so that you can acquire a certain set of skills that are transferable. Um, I am a huge proponent of um, acquiring experience through internships, freelance work. Um, now with the advent of uh, digital media, you can self-produce uh, content, whether it's the written word or video. Um, whatever you do, you should start now. And whatever you aspire to do, you should start gaining experience in some fashion or form as soon as you can. There are individuals that already have that are your age, uh, that are in college, and that are actively working on gaining that experience. It's critically important. So I encourage you to do that. Educate yourself, right, uh, by sitting in, in um, presentations like the one that Comweek will uh, will present to you. 
but other ways, read the trades, go online, look for um, information related to the area that you are most interested in pursuing and immerse yourself in that information, right? There's nothing more valuable when you, than when you do get your opportunity to go loaded with questions that convey an understanding of what you eventually want to do or the job that you're interviewing for. That's the most powerful way to demonstrate that you're a viable candidate, whether it's an internship, your first job, or you know, job number 10 throughout your career. Uh, the more you know about the job you want to do, the better off you will be. And then the final thing is when you do get an opportunity at whatever level it is, I remind people uh, of the acronym PI. Um, you want to definitely make sure that you uh, are mindful of your performance. But a lot of times that's not the only, that's not the only factor. It's performance plus image plus exposure. And by image, what I mean is your, your image, your individual brand, who it is that you want people to see you, uh, how you want people to see you, the way you want people to see you, how do you present that brand, your individual brand and image is really important. And then exposure. When you do get an opportunity, you want to make sure that you are um, that you are affording yourself exposure to individuals within an organization, internally and externally, right? Feature the work you're doing on LinkedIn, on platforms like LinkedIn and Twitter, and make sure that you're promoting the, the, the end product, the things that you're doing, the accomplishments that you have, I think that's really, really important. And in this day and age, right, the tools are in place for you to be able to do just that. So remind yourself of that pie, um, performance, your image, your brand, uh, and the exposure. How do you ex uh, gain exposure for the good work, the accomplishments, um, the things that you are doing while you're gaining that, uh, that, exp uh, that experience? David, thank you. That was very, very insightful information. Uh, I, I have my students in the class and they're, 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 they're writing down everything you just said uh, on, the, on your last slide. Very, thank very you. important information. <laughs> and, and so uh, one question for me, David, that I wanna ask uh, for, and, and we're living in a world where content is king. Um, and we're living in a world where uh, we the pandemic has showed us that things are different and, and you can produce material from uh, any location that you're at just by using your laptop or using uh, a, a nice uh, DSLR camera connection. You know, so the world has changed a lot for us with the pandemic, some for the better. Uh, I think in this business, it's, it's giving us some different resources that we can use. So the question is going to be, uh, why and how is AT&T? Okay, a, a, an, an entity like at and in the world we live in right now with all this content is out there, how important is for you and your team to produce content on the local level to where people can, in, can and enjoy that? Because obviously ESPN is out there, but there's more of a national, but yeah. you guys are really content, are concentrating on the local uh, and regional sports. How important is that? Well, you know, from from a, that's a great, it's a really great question. I, I think there's a couple of aspects of that, Arthur, that I that I'd like to touch on. Right, your point related to, you know, during the the pandemic, we have had to reinvent, literally reinvent, as the local stations have had to reinvent um, the way they create content, and so. Right, we talked about that slide where we were doing the global feeds moving into the cloud uh, production, cloud uh, control productions, right? That is, uh, would we have, would we have uh, done productions like that down the road? We likely would have at some point, uh, but it has accelerated the need for us to do that, right? And so uh, from that perspective, that's a byproduct of the pandemic. I also think something that we were willing to do that we up until this point were not and local news you see this a lot 
and even uh, national platforms, right? Up until the start of the pandemic, it would be literally a cardinal sin to do a Zoom interview and put that on a broadcast, right? And to your point, right, um, the pandemic put us in a position where we've had to do things differently, do things remotely. The consumer still wants information. The consumer still wants to see Dusty Baker after a game, right, talk about Jose Altuve's three-hit game, or, you know, what happened to Verlander in the seventh inning, right? They still want that. Up until this point, uh, our folks, the television professionals, would have cringed at the notion that we would do that over a Zoom, right? Now, universally, it's become accepted. The NFL did their draft two years ago from the commissioner's basement and basically did it via Zoom. All of the uh, coaches, instead of being in the war room in their individual marketplaces, were in their living room or were you know, in the kitchen or wherever they were doing their Zoom engagement from making those picks. So it has changed both our impression of what is acceptable and it has reinforced the importance to your point, content is king. The fans still want that content and they're willing to see it produced, delivered in a different uh, format and a different fashion and form before. Um, and set that all aside. Let's just talk about the sort of how do we get to getting ready for a game production. We, um, our staff is only allowed to go into the studio. Limited number of folks, 12 to 15 folks can go in while we're producing the live game. And that's it. Everybody else, all of our prep work, uh, all of our meetings. I literally met, left a Zoom meeting with my production management to get onto this Zoom. And I have a Zoom on the back end of this, right? So I am not in a conference room with folks day in and day out. Our producers are talking to reporters in various locations by Zoom and doing all of that prep work, coming up with, okay, what are the storylines that we're going to cover? Um, I'm droning on here, but I, I definitely want to talk about, right, the pandemic also reinforced the need for um, the insatiable appetite for content, right? So AT&T, which is a Fortune 10 corporation, uh, we have 300,000 employees in the United States. Uh, during the first 12 months of the pandemic, the only individuals that were allowed to report to a workplace were, uh, uh, were required uh, employees. Those are folks that installed dishes. Those are folks that are technicians and engineers, that sort of thing, that literally to make sure that the systems work were in place we were able to get um, an exemption to a work remote uh, directive from the corporation for our staff to go in and produce programs because that content mattered so much, right? Because of the importance and significance of, in the grand scheme of things, it's only a sporting event. It's only an Astros game, only a Rockets game. Um, in a sort of, in another aspect, it is important, right, to occupy and, and entertain and get folks sort of, um, you know, back to some uh, resemblance of normal. Uh, and, and that's what we talked about all the time is how can we look as normal as possible? How can we get those games on as quickly as possible? And right? if you think back to the NBA scrambling to get all of their games to be played in Orlando, but broadcast to all of those local marketplaces, right? We didn't have anybody in Orlando, but we were broadcasting games for the Rockets back here for three months. Um, and that ties back to that, you know, the significance of getting that content component back to some degree of normal. Thank you, David. Uh, we have about, I think we're about two minutes remaining. 
Uh, and, I, and I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, is there any last minute things you want to share with the students? And, um, you know, for as, far as, as, as far as their journey in the sports or getting into sports or creating content, is, is there anything you want to share with them? Well, I, you know, Arthur, this, I know that the, I know that the subject is related to um, communications in a digital world. And um, I was joking with uh, an individual that I went to college with, uh, journalism school uh, with back in the day. And, uh, you know, we were debating, he was a couple of years ahead of mine. You know, he was talking about, you know, writing news stories out by hand. And I was joking about using an IBM Selectra typewriter, right? The computer wasn't even a part of a newsroom. And now, if you think about where we are, what I would what I would say to the students at, at Texas Southern right now is take advantage of every opportunity to do what it, do what you aspire to do in in this digital world because self self producing content, self publishing content actually getting out there and doing it at the end of the day, um, you know, it's a little bit like working out. You want to build those muscles and the more you can do it, um, you know, going back to a point I made earlier, and that is the best way to prepare for you, getting your first internship, getting your first job, you know, moving up to, you know, the, the, the next level beyond your first job is to be able to walk in and have an understanding of the job you want to do and creating content if that's ultimately what you want to do in some fashion or form whether it's written video you know whether it's graphics whatever that is do it don't wait don't sort of wait until somebody says okay you can be an intern or you can have this entry level job to do it the digital environment affords everyone the opportunity. When I turn this Zoom off, I literally could go create content and publish it direct to consumer. The other thing I would say is that it affords everybody with, with even limited resources the ability to gain experience. You don't have to have a super expensive piece of equipment to do uh, what we're talking about doing here, right? And that's to be creative, create content and, uh, and have people look at it. So that would be the, the one final piece of advice. Take advantage of the period of time where we, you are afforded the ability to do, not just hope to do, not aspire to do, you literally can do. And, um, and, and, and I would embrace that in, in any form, right? I know that this group is, you know, a wide ranging, uh, uh, you know, students that are looking to do a bunch of different things. You boil it down to the quicker I can get to doing what I aspire to do, right? The better off I will be, the better prepared I will be. That for me would be the, the sort of the, the, the first step. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we once again we appreciate everything that you do for our for our school of communications thank and um, and being an advisory board member and just taking the time out of your busy day to spend time and, and talk with students uh, is is so important uh, for us. And it's a team. It's a team. It's a team effort. So uh, we have our own sports team here uh, in Houston, but we have our team at SOC. So <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a nice team effort. So we really appreciate it, David. And uh, thank you. Is there anything, uh, students, you guys want to ask any more questions before we go? Anyone? Thank you. He said, my, my, my class says, thank you, David. Thank you. Appreciate you guys coming out. And, thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Nothing can stop me, I'm all the way